Welcome to our uh, seventh webinar of the year. Uh, we have uh, today with us uh, Dr. Bijan Shaheen as our speaker. Uh, Bijan um, is a professor of political science as, uh, at um, Haji Peta University, and he is also founder and president of uh, Freedom Research Association. Uh, which is a liberal think tank based uh, at Ankara. Uh, Bijan has uh, written extensively on uh, liberalism uh, and its relationship with Islam. Um, that he has um, spoken at various uh, conferences um, and had been a part of our network. Uh, in fact, also was there when this network was founded back in, in Istanbul. Um, uh, for uh, today's uh, webinar, we have uh, chosen uh, a, a very important topic, uh, which uh, Bijan uh, have worked. Um, it's a discussion uh, between the uh, the role of uh, religion and role of secularism in running the matter of the state, uh, particularly in societies. Um, the uh, uh, practice of faith are very important. And the uh, question uh, or the topic we are discussing today is whether uh, a secular framework or a religious framework, um, that is uh, a system of law based either on, on a religion, which one is more appropriate uh, for uh, part of the states. Uh, um, we uh, we will hear uh, Bijan uh, sharing his thoughts for uh, about twenty to thirty minutes. Um, uh, after that, we will move into a question and answer uh, session. Uh, for uh, uh, for today's uh, webinar. Um, we have uh, we have switched on a discussion mode, uh, which means that um, uh, the participants have the option of uh, speaking directly um, on their audio. They can they can speak uh, to and others can hear. Or they like to hand over uh, to Bijan for uh, his uh, opening statement and presentation on this topic. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, does everyone hear me well? I hope uh, you can hear me well. And I am very pleased to uh, speak and um, share my views on uh, this issue with you. Uh, in my presentation, I will start with a um, definition of freedom and then move from there to discuss freedom of uh, religion and conscience and, uh, and the relationship between secularism and uh, freedom of conscience. <clears throat> uh, as you may all be uh, aware, um, Freedom can be defined as uh, the ability to lead our lives as we wish. This requires uh, that we are left alone. We are not interfered from outside and uh, we will be um, tolerated and we will be left uh, with our own decisions in terms of um, leading our lives. This, uh, this is usually uh, described or designed uh, as designated as negative freedom, meaning uh, a person is free to the extent that he or she is not interfered from outside. Sometimes this is referred to as freedom from, freedom from intervention, freedom from oppression, for example. 
So, uh, in opposition to uh, negative freedom, meaning freedom as being alone or being left alone, uh, we see also the concept of positive freedom, according to which a person can be free only when she or he has some power to do things that she wishes to do. So, in this perspective, which is called positive freedom, a person may be left alone, a person may have a private sphere in which nobody interferes with her decisions. However, if she does not have, let's say, material resources, she is not considered to be a free person. This is the understanding of positive freedom. Another interpretation of positive freedom is that freedom is related with how you use your uh, freedom, meaning nobody will interfere with you, but that doesn't make you free. Are you going to use this opportunity of being left alone to use good things or bad things? If you choose to do good things, then you can be considered as a free person. So this is different, two different interpretations of uh, positive freedom. First one, first interpretation tells us that we need to have material things uh, before we can consider ourselves as free persons. If I don't have money to buy a ticket to fly to Malaysia, then uh, the fact that I have a passport does not make me free. Because if I don't have the money, even if there is no uh, barriers in front of my travel uh, to, to Malaysia, since I do not have money to buy a ticket, I cannot in reality fly to Malaysia. This is a positive freedom in terms of material <clears throat> ability, resources. The other uh, interpretation of positive freedom is that uh, you are free only when you choose the right to do the right thing. So liberals tend to think that uh, in this distinction between negative and positive freedoms, we liberals should side with negative freedoms because positive freedoms can be subjective especially this uh, positive freedom. That is, who will decide what is worthwhile or not? Uh, something that I want to do may not be appealing to you. You may despise it. You may dislike it. But I may, however, want to do it. So you, if we say that, okay, you have the ability to decide uh, what is right, what is wrong, or what is freedom, what is not, then you may prevent me from doing the thing that I want to do. So this is a restrictive understanding for liberals. So liberals just say that as long as we are left alone, we are not interfered, we, from outside we are free. Now, this is the general discussion of freedom. Let's put this aside for now. I would like to go now with the discussion of freedom of conscience and religion. For doing that, I would like to briefly talk about uh, conscience. Adam Smith, uh, one of the founding fathers of uh, liberal thinking, liberal thought, says that conscience is the man within our breast who tells us what is right, what is wrong. Conscience. When we do something in accordance with our conscience, we feel good. We feel rectitude. On the other hand, 
when we do something against our conscience, we feel remorse. We feel bad about, about it, right? Something bothers us. Something makes us remorseful. So we want to pick it up many times. <clears throat> so there is a reward and a punishment process within every individual, within every individual that has conscience, so to speak. Uh, and <clears throat> in this respect, some uh, liberals uh, think that this is a very important ability and we have great interest to follow our conscience. In fact, one of the contemporary liberal thinkers named Chandra Kukatas, uh, who is an ethnic Tamil from Malaysia, but citizen of Australia, and working in London School of Economics. He says, argues that leading a life according to our conscience is the basic human interest. Stated again, stated differently, the ability to lead a life according to our own conscience is our fundamental human interest. He says, in a sense, what distinguishes from other creatures is that we have conscience and human beings want to live according to their consciences. So, in this respect, he uh, places freedom of conscience and religion at the top of uh, liberal agenda. And uh, so, freedom of conscience, in this sense, can be defined as an ability to lead our life on the basis of our conscientious belief and the right to believe or not to believe. Not only believe, but if you like, not to believe in a religion. If you believe in religion, you should also have the right to conduct the rituals of, uh, of the religion that you believe in. Now, I think so far we have established the meaning of freedom and in the second part we established the importance and meaning of freedom of conscience and furthermore we can say that freedom of conscience and religion is a form of negative freedom in the sense that it is it's a uh, example of an example of freedom from oppression I mean, when I want my freedom of conscience and religion, I just want to be left alone. I don't want to be interfered from outside. I don't need to demand things from others. I just want to believe in, in a certain way or not to believe. And then I want other individuals and institutions In this respect. <clears throat> now, how can freedom of conscience and religion be curtailed? We can say at least in two different ways. One way is from other individuals, that is, our friends, our families our community can interfere with our freedom of conscience and religion. They may create barriers in front of our conscience. They may force us to believe in a certain way. Okay? 
The second and more important uh, way of uh, or means of uh, curtailing freedom of conscience is the state as an institution which has the uh, monopoly of using coercive power state can interfere with our freedom of religion with our freedom of conscience throughout history we have seen that sometimes states adopt a certain religion right and they say that this is the foundation of our country and all citizens needs to follow uh, our religious beliefs sometimes uh, a state can base uh, its uh, foundations on a certain interpretation certain sect of a religion all right in some other cases in some other cases state may just try to oppress religion state may reject religion and try to suppress it try to create a secular society try to make everyone irreligious and um, so this can be done in the name of nationalism in the name of communism marxism in the name of modernism sometimes and um, so in any case individuals freedom of conscience are curtailed now in the first instance when our freedom of conscience is curtailed by um, our friends our parents or our community it may be easier to deal with it we may seize our relationships with our friends we may even say to our family just leave me alone don't interfere with my conscience and uh, we may somehow deal with it even with the community you can leave the community you can exit from the community that you used to belong if you no longer believe in what that community believes in however it is much more difficult to dissociate ourselves from the state of which we are citizens especially when we think about the, the world of nation states can we easily leave our states and choose to live in another state where we can enjoy you know our uh, freedom of conscience this can be done it may not be impossible but it is very difficult as we witness you know in especially in recent years many people who are forced to leave their countries who become refugees have big problems uh, to find a peaceful living place let alone uh, you know experience their freedom of conscience so the state has much more power it can punish us very badly it can take away our uh, freedom not only freedom of conscience but our you know basic freedoms and uh, it can take away our livelihoods so when a state um, interferes with our freedom of conscience and religion it is much more costly very shortly <clears throat> so liberals in this respect uh, think that um, a state that is based on a religion or a state that rejects freedom of religion treats uh, its citizens unequally and unjustly so in order to avoid that we need a secular state 
you do not need to have a secular society, but we need a secular legal framework where citizens can have uh, equal access to freedom of conscience and religion. So they will not be discriminated in terms of their beliefs or conscientiously. And uh, so they, a secular state, as citizens, we can believe and um, experience uh, the rituals our, of our religion. Um, and uh, there should not be uh, barriers in front of conducting our lives according to our religion. Uh, the only barriers that can be imposed in front of us must be related with public order and security. I mean, if our um, rituals, if our uh, beliefs do not pose any uh, threats or any harm to the basic rights, life, liberty, and property rights of other individuals, must be tolerated, must be left free. So, um, another point also is related uh, with religion. Um, our question was that, you know, do we need a religious framework to experience our, I, I mean, do we need a secular framework to experience our religion to the full extent? I think one can view that uh, religion or belief is a matter of conscience. And conscience uh, is something subjective. It is not something that can be dictated from outside. Individuals should entertain their beliefs by themselves. They can be advised, they can be taught things, but in the final analysis, the belief must be coming from within, within the individual. So only in a secular state, we can say for sure that uh, individuals do follow religion because they believe they believe in it. Uh, in states where religions are imposed on individuals by the state power, one cannot be sure that a person a, a person who is acting this way does it sincerely or just to avoid punishment, right? I mean, if there is a punishment when I don't follow a religious rule uh, by the state, then if I don't want to be punished, I will just pretend that I believe in the religion and act accordingly. This is just, you know, a fake, uh, a unsincere uh, behavior. Uh, secondly, one can say that religions are also open to interpretation. And uh, if a state wants to make religion its basis, which interpretation will it adopt? When the state accepts one uh, interpretation, and, and plus, uh, if the citizens disagree with that interpretation, then there can be religious conflict uh, and civil strife within society. So if we want to enjoy peace, and uh, if we want to enjoy our religion in a sincere way, I think the best solution, legal solution, or a uh, political solution is to have a secular state. Individuals and groups within uh, society 
can be religious or irreligious. It is up to them. But the state is a political uh, instrument which needs to uh, treat all of its citizens with equal respect should be uh, without a religion in my perspective. So uh, I should also underline the view that uh, this is not the control of the religion by the state. Secularism sometimes is understood as the control of religion by the state. So uh, many religious people, both Muslim or non-Muslim, uh, they detest, they dislike this kind of view, and they rightly do so. I mean, you know, there have been experiences of that kind. For example, the French tradition is based on the control of religion by the state. It is believed that, you know, when religion is left free, it will invade uh, all aspects of the society and it should be under control. But the more liberal understanding of um, secularism is based on freedom of conscience and religion and depends on uh, leaving individuals free and keeping the state out of uh, religion. So this is the um, theoretical and uh, let's say conceptual framework that I wanted to uh, share with you, dear participants. And uh, if you like, we can now go, uh, go on uh, with questions, comments, and answers. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bijan, for uh, your uh, uh, opening um, presentation on this important question. Um, we are, um, uh, this discussion is now open for questions and comments. Um, the participants uh, can use their audio, uh, but I request the participants to turn off their video so that we can uh, enjoy the, uh, the uh, a smooth uh, webinar, but they can use uh, their audio and speak into their microphone. Everyone will hear. And they can also type in the questions uh, in the chat box we have. Okay, so we have uh, an agreement there. So I hope that there is a, also yeah. a disagreement somewhere. Okay. Let me let me uh, while while others are um, also forming their questions uh, or their opinions. Uh, uh, as as uh, as you know, the, this discussion about uh, secularism and uh, religious framework is uh, particularly very sensitive in Muslim majority countries. Um, and I, I, we, I, I'm, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. Your uh, your voice. We're just echoing. Can you also write it down? Okay. Or just or try again. I mean, I didn't hear. Okay. So um, I know I was saying that um, in the Muslim majority countries, this question of uh, the uh, secularism versus uh, religious freedom is particularly sensitive. We uh, we see that the constitution becomes uh, a playground for this discussion quite often. Okay, let me. I for some reason, I I have I think.
Okay, I can I can read Muhammad Amin's question or comment, so to speak, uh, and I I agree with this uh, comment to a great extent. Um, specific religious groups capture the state and then wish to use state power to coerce all citizens to comply with the religious wishes of the controlling group. Um, yeah, that seems to be the case. And perhaps in the past, this has also been the case for Christian countries, right? The Protestants or Catholics Catholics wanted to capture the state power and uh, impose their understanding of religion on the rest of the society. However, after very costly religious wars, they came to conclude that you know, this is not a good choice. And uh, religious tolerance and uh, also secular state uh, <clears throat> seem to emerge out of this understanding. In our case, it seems we still haven't got, gotten this idea. In Turkey, it is an example. From my own country, I can give the example. Um, it is argued by uh, government circles that uh, within the state, uh, there has been a religious infiltration, a religious group, a natural political means, but using... Uh, bureaucratic means tried to capture uh, the state power. So that means some groups may try to capture the state power through elections, let's say, and once they are in power, they use the state and government for their purposes. And some other religious groups may just try to infiltrate the state institutions through bureaucratic means and uh, try to use it. I mean, this this has been allegation, and it has it may have some share of truth to it. Uh, and uh, in the case of Turkey, I mean, uh, there also there may be other cases from other countries you may uh, share with us where groups uh, try to capture the state. I mean. In our Muslim societies, we should come to the conclusion that the state apparatus should be there only to provide peace and order. The state should not be distributing wealth. The state should not be promoting morality. It should only provide us security and justice. Otherwise, you know, either religious people will capture and impose their views on others, or let's say secularists will capture the power and will try to suppress the religious people. So either way is uh, not a good uh, solution. And Ali's question, okay, in Muslim majority Companies. This discussion is very sensitive, and we have two types of constitutions, secular and Islamic. Do you have any thoughts on this comparison? Very, very good question. Thank you, Ali. Yes, um, I, I continue to think about this issue as well. From my presentation, you can uh, see that I am close to the view of having a secular constitution rather than a religious Islamic constitution. But even with a secular constitution, I would say that full uh, freedom of religion and conscience must be guaranteed. That is, it does not need to refer to Islam or Christianity or any religion uh, in this sense. But full uh, uh, freedom in terms of um, experiencing uh, religious uh, beliefs. And, uh, but some countries may say, okay, let's say 
we want to base our constitution on religion X. In this case, let's say in Islam, and we will tolerate other religions. We will give other religions uh, full liberty. For example, in the previous centuries, let's say in the Islamic history, Islam has been made the foundation of, uh, let's say, uh, the state. In the case of Ottoman Empire, for example, it was an Islamic state. And at the same time, it provided uh, religious freedoms to minorities, non-Islamic, non non-Muslim minorities, Christians, Do you hear me? I'm sorry that I got disconnected yes. for some reason. Do you hear me now? Can you follow me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry for the inter interruption. Oh, yeah, I mean, an Ottoman Empire system, the Millet system, has provided, you know, relative security and freedom to other religions. But my question is that, Let's say we are in the position of minority. How would we feel? Wouldn't we feel in some respects unequal with the majority members of the society? And uh, would that be treating the citizens with equal respect? Because in the Islamic uh, experience, Muslims were considered to be uh, the owners of the state and hierarchically they were superior to non-Muslims. Um, and secondly, which interpretation of Islam are we going to base our constitution? I am not a theologian, I am not an expert on Quran and Islam. But to the best of my knowledge, our religion is also open to interpretation and there are different sects, interpretations of it. And um, if we choose one of them, if the state chooses one, then um, the rest of the Muslims which does not subscribe to, let's say, <clears throat> dominant view. So this creates a difficulty as well for, for a state, uh, for an Islamic state. So, um, in this respect, having a secular state may help this. But how about the um, pluralism? I heard at one point uh, Ali talking about pluralism, right? That is the state, let's say the state will not say that I am an Islamic state. I am just a, I'm a liberal state and I provide uh, freedom to all groups to uh, carry on their lives on the basis of their own uh, systems. That is, Muslims want to have Sharia courts, then they may have. If Christians, if Jews want to have their own Courts and uh, you know affairs based on their religion, they have. 
This made me similar to a liberal anarchist society, perhaps. I mean, liberal anarchists say that the state will not exist, basically, right? For uh, anarcho-capitalists or liberal anarchists, there will be no state. The law will be provided by competing agencies. So different understandings of law, uh, legal traditions can be provided. However, in our example, we say that a state will exist. It may have its own secular code of law. And uh, also, it can accommodate, let's say, other legal frameworks. Maybe Sharia law, Sharia courts for, for those Muslims who want to go there. And uh, for others, for Christians, Jews, you know, according to their own traditions. This may be a very creative solution. I am not sure about its sustainability. To what extent can it be sustainable? But you know, in terms of thinking, in theoretical, uh, let's say, you know, farazia. I don't know if this is the right word, but in a you know hypothetical uh, situation, we can think about this and we can maybe talk about it. So. My um, solution, as I said so far, is closer to a liberal secular constitution with full freedom of religion and conscience. But I am open to discussion uh, for other uh, options as well. Okay, Abdul Basset Bahadur. In the major majority of countries, okay, first of all, thanks all for the topic, but I have a related question, that if the origin of freedoms, whatever its kind, was from an Islamic source, do we need secularism to govern it? All right. Um, that's a good question. If the origins of origin of freedoms, whatever its kind, was from an Islamic source, do we need secularism to govern it? So do we have um, the source of all uh, freedoms in Islam? And uh, also still if we call it is call it as Islamic state, do we have equal respect? to all members of our society uh, would be my answer. I mean, we may say that all freedoms are based in Islam as well. Let's say freedom of conscience is available in Islam. There is no compulsion in Islam. Or um, one can get, get out of religion from in Islam as well. You know, the, <laughs> Irtidat, right? That is the right to exit from religion. This is a controversial issue, I know. Uh, some more liberal interpreters of Islam thinks that <clears throat> it is possible to get out of uh, religion and uh, without losing your life, without a heavy punishment. But still, Let's say even if we accept that all freedoms can be found in Islam, if we base our state on the religion, on Islam, non-Muslims may feel that they are discriminated. They are not equally respected. That's my view.
Um, do we need a platform that leads Muslims to live in peace and freedom without looking for another approach? Example of secularism. Why do we have uh, problems? Why do we have conflict with secularism and Islam? Also, that, that, might, that might be my answer to, to your question. I mean, if you think that um, Islam has the source of all uh, freedoms, then why do we think that secularism and Islam are conflictual with one another? I think those who think that secularism somehow conflicts with Islam think and believe, may believe, that um, some of the things that secularism promotes are unacceptable from a religious point of view. The most important of it is the right not to believe. What do you think? I mean, uh, freedom of conscience and religion and secularism that is based on it gives us the right and freedom to believe and not to believe, in my view. In an Islamic state, can we also provide this right to not to believe? Those liberal interpreters say that we may, but still the question, does any Islamic state treat all its citizens with equal respect? Meaning, I mean, let's say a, a non-Muslim or a non-believer, would that person feel undiscriminated and equal? That is my question. I agree with Imad Ettin Ahmad totally. That's the case with France and that used to be the case with Turkey. Uh, in my presentation, I try to emphasize that the state can interfere with freedom of uh, conscience and religion in two ways. One way is that the state can adopt a certain religion and try to impose it on the, uh, the citizens and citizens may feel oppressed. You know, they may not believe in that religion or they may believe in a different sect. So this is curtailment, curtailing the uh, freedom of co uh, conscience and religion. The other way of uh, curtailing this conscience, this freedom of conscience and religion is by oppressing religion. The French way that is controlling this uh, religion by state is another way of interfering with freedom of conscience and religion. This has been also the case in Turkey in the past. Um, I mean, in order to create a secular society, the state wanted to control religion and religious symbols were um, prohibited from public square. For example, um, headscarf used to be uh, prohibited in Turkey. It is not permitted. Uh, this is a progress in the right direction, in my view. Uh, the current problem is rather um, encouraging or promoting religion uh, through uh, using public sources. That might be another problem as well. This is still not imposition of the religion by the state, but if uh, the state tries to promote religion through uh, public resources, I think that would still be uh, some encroachment of uh, freedom of conscience and religion of the citizens. It would be unfair for non-believers or for non-Muslims to promote Islam through their uh, tax money.
that 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 is uh, I think in my view uh, a problem in Turkey, especially with respect to promotion of uh, religious high schools. Uh, the numbers of uh, religious high schools are um, increased to a great extent. To most, uh, uh, according to most um, uh, views, uh, more than the demand in the in the market, and these are publicly financed uh, schools. I would say this uh, this wouldn't this would be unfair. Muhammad Amin. I agree with Mohammed Amin's uh, pro, uh, yes um, statement that it's the basic right not to believe in God, and uh, if any state prohibits it, then it is not a free state. I agree. The problems in France derive from history because French liberalism was created in direct opposition to control the Catholic Church. Yes, I think we need to familiarize ourselves with also the historical background of societies. What historical events made the French people, uh, French seculars, let's say, to be so sensitive about religion and so, uh, uh, how to say, guard, guard, uh, guard, guarding themselves from religion? Um, the prior mistakes of religious uh, authorities may have been influential in that as well. I mean, uh, we know the Vatican Church, the Papal Church, used to be in uh, politics. Con not only religion, but they were also in politics and uh, controlled to a great extent uh, lands and wealth may have created a backlash and um, so the reaction was not directed only against uh, the church but to religion in general. So I think we need to promote an understanding of religion uh, that religion is an individual matter and individuals freely can come together with other believers and they can establish their communities, they can promote their beliefs and want to live according to their beliefs. But the state should not uh, promote them or hinder them. Uh, the United States comes close to the model I think I am also defending here. In the United States, we see that the state does not interfere with religious groups to a great extent, not totally. Imad knows much better than I do and uh, may comment on that if he likes. Uh, but basically, there is more freedom of religion, uh, freedom of religion and conscience in the United States than many other places. And also, there are religious people who want to uh, influence politics. So we need to be careful about that as well, and we need to uh, defend full freedom of religion, but at the same time uh, defend the secular uh, political sphere. Uh, we should not let uh, religious people capture the, the state and impose their understanding of religion on believers and non-believers. Uh, the question by uh, with, from Ali, uh, if there is any fundamental shifts in Turkish constitution during Erdogan regime from secularist to a more Islamic? No, the answer is no. In terms of constitution, uh, you, one cannot say that, for example, there has not been amendments saying that the religion of the state is Islam or uh, or the state affairs must be conducted on the basis of uh, Islamic rules. No, there has not been also direct imposition, no direct imposition of Islam. Uh, but 
However, as I said, I can talk about the promotion of religion by the state resources and also allocation of resources towards more religious purposes and towards more conservative groups. And uh, as a liberal uh, democrat, my position is that the state should not be able, shouldn't, shouldn't do that. I was very supportive of Erdogan's government when they were trying to um, expand the, free, the fear of religious freedom. In the past, religious, Muslim religious people were unable to experience their religious beliefs, like, or to some extent were discriminated. They were not unable to to, to full extent to experience. Of course, <clears throat> uh, Muslims were able to uh, visit uh, Mecca, uh, the pilgrimage, and uh, five times a day they they could pray, etc., etc. But let's say women couldn't uh, wear hats, headscarf, and work at the public office, or wouldn't go to universities. So. And uh, Erdogan government um, created freedoms, uh, or when they um, abolished those prohibitions, the government did the right thing. So, as a free, uh, as a liberal democrat, I welcome this. I chair, I applaud this as an expansion of freedom of conscience and religion. However, as a person. Who believes in uh, the uh, secular uh, structure of the state, so to speak? I think that the state should not use public resources and uh, should not uh, make religious discourse its uh, its main discourse. So that's what I am saying. In Morocco. For example, all religions live side by side and are not even belonging, and this is based on respect. But why not see this in secular states' freedom to dress religion and others? That we would say that the source of political and civil liberties of secular background. Hmm. I did not fully understand uh, Abdel Basset Bahadur's uh, question. All religions live side by side and are not even belonging, and this is based on respect. But in Morocco, uh, Muslims are required to follow certain uh, religious rules, don't they? Aren't they? That is, for example, um, consumption of alcohol, um, public consumption. Is it prohibited? Is it or legal to to buy and consume in uh, public places, public restaurants? Um, so, for for example, is is a non, is a non-Muslim allowed to feel, to lead a non-Islamic non way of life, an Islamic way of life? Does Morocco provide this, uh, this freedom? At, at hotels, I know, you, you can. But are, are there public uh, restaurants and bars and uh, with your Muslim identity uh, as a person for coming from, let's say, Morocco or from Turkey? What I'm trying to understand is that uh, whether there is uh, freedom of conscience. Okay, that, that I didn't know that. My impression was that uh, it was out uh, in public places. In the hotels or other places, uh, you were you are able, but in other places, I I 
my impression was that you you were not okay i mean you know like um secularism as it is implemented in the united states a law uh, allows individuals to have um, secular dresses i mean muslim women can uh, get dressed in an islamic way or jewish uh, people can have their you know uh, kippa on their heads and work so i think secular states can also provide the right uh, rightly understood secularism can provide those freedoms I see that uh, I think Imad is typing uh, typing in yeah, a question. I, so we take that Abdul Basit Bahadur. Yeah, yeah, a question or a comment? Yeah. By the way, uh, while we wait um, for, for Iman's question, uh, just an additional observation. Um, in, um, in Malaysia, you, you mentioned about, uh, uh, about Sharia and its, implement, and its uh, implementation in Muslim countries. There is a big discussion. There had been a, in Malaysia, there has been a big discussion around uh, 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 the uh, Sharia-inspired punishments or, or khudud. Um, and and people have viewed that, uh, for instance, if the majority of uh, a state uh, are happy, democratically speaking, in adoption of uh, these hudud, uh, then these hudud uh, should be implemented uh, because people have, by by choice, by their democratic opinion, have favored uh, such punishments. Uh, but um, uh, the other groups have reacted to it. Um, the government, the federal government in Malaysia, has has reacted to it that uh, there cannot be such uh, multiple um, uh, that there is to be one law, uh, uniform rule of uh, you know re uniform legal code in the country, and we cannot have multiple legal codes in the country. Uh, so. Sometimes the Muslims, uh, the Muslim Democrats, uh, question this approach that, well, we are democratically demanding this, and then we are not given this right to implement those punishments, which we believe uh, are, are true. Uh, you know. I see. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, let's say uh, a state. Uh, accepted uh, Sharia law as uh, one of the laws. Would that state also accept that Muslims can have the option to be not to be uh, subject to Sharia law? I mean, as a Muslim, for example, living in that state, can I say I don't want Sharia law law? To, to be implemented to me. I want secular law. Or mm -hmm. can I get, yeah, uh, and still keep my religion. You know, I want to stay mm -hmm. as a Muslim, but I don't want, you know, Islamic law to be implemented. And mm -hmm. um, also, can I uh, exit religion? 
can I uh, you know, change my religion? Uh, if, mm. ideally speaking, if the answers are yes, I mean, yes, you can uh, change your religion without any uh, harm to you, and or if you stay as Muslim, but if you don't want this to be implemented to you, that's also okay. They these might be, ideally speaking, preferable. I mean, preferable in terms of choice, right? Pluralism of choice choices in terms of legal uh, comes close to liberal anarchist ideal. Uh, yeah, but in many in many cases so far, um, it seems that the implementation has not been uh, this way. Uh, usually, uh, when you know a, a group captures the power, wants to make the law uniform, either secular uniform or religious uniform. And in, in fact, I have heard uh, the Islamic uh, the Islamists arguing that those Muslims who do not want uh, those punishments to be introduced, they can leave that state. They can they can migrate uh, if they don't like to be in that state and uh, follow the Islamic punishments. They are supposedly they have the option of exiting the state itself, but not exiting the religion, but the state itself. All right. Um, I think we um, we can actually move to the concluding parts uh, of uh, this uh, this webinar. Um, we have discussed, um, we have followed this question of do we need a secular legal framework for protection of faith? That was the basic theme of this webinar. Um, uh, and Bijan uh, Shaheen has explained his position that uh, he favors a more secular legal framework, which he considers important for, um, uh, for religious freedom itself. Um, and then we have heard about some questions um, and comments from the participants. Um, and um, is there a final thought? Um, Bijan, would you like to sort of uh, share wrap, or as a wrapping up concluding remarks before we sign off? Yeah, I mean, basically, yeah, you summarized uh, my position. And uh, I'm also open to debate uh, pluralism, the option of pluralism. Uh, Malaysia is interested, is presenting an, a, a, an interesting case uh, in this regard. Uh, and uh, both, uh, I mean, pros and cons of this uh, model, uh, I think, should be discussed definitely. Um, there's always room for improvement. And Imad Ettin made a, a comment saying secular states can prohibit alcohol as well. In the U.S., there are dry towns and counties where alcohol may not be served in public. Also, for many years, there was a national prohibition on alcohol. And yeah, with this prohibition of alcohol uh, is also, uh, uh, you yeah, know, criticize, we can criticize it from the freedom aspect. I mean, as a secular state, uh, by prohibiting alcohol um, for secular, on secular grounds, may, may, maybe, not only for religious grounds, but on secular grounds, uh, the United States government uh, violated a basic right of individuals. Right, individuals couldn't live their lives as, as they wanted, so that's that's also problematic for secular reasons. Prohibitions may be also problematic. All right. Um, would I you like done. to take this last question? Uh, sorry, would you like to take this last question before we wrap it? No, I, I just yeah. I I think I also made my uh, short comment on it. And um, 
Is there another question? Oh, Muhammad Suleiman. I didn't see. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Muhammad Suleiman has a question. Many Muslim clerics consider that secularism is anti-Islam and even they equate it with atheism. Do you think secularism is anti-Islam and secular values are threat to Islamic values? Uh, no. Uh, my answer is no. Uh, as I tried to explain uh, in my uh, presentation, we can distinguish secularism of individual and society from the secularism of state, secular state. I mean, in a secular in a secular state, the members of the society can be Muslim, Christian, Jewish, whatever religion, or atheist, non-believer. But um, in a secular state, individuals will have freedom to experience their religions as long as they do not pose any uh, security threat to other groups by, uh, by you know, uh, by their religious practices. And um, so in this regard, I don't think that um, secularism is, is anti-Islam. Uh, we need to distinguish between religion uh, from uh, politics, for, from uh, the state. Um, as an ethical code, as, an, um, as a belief system, I think, uh, in my view, they are compatible. We can have a secular state and a Muslim society, in my view. Is there any other questions? Okay. Mm, no, I, I, I don't see any, uh, any other questions, so I think we can conclude at this point. Uh, but this is a fair conclusion, uh, I think, Bijan, which you have drawn. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, dear participants, and thank you so much, uh, Bijan, for uh, giving us uh, this uh, very important and informative uh, presentation. And I also thank participants uh, for their questions and comments. Um, and at this point, I'd like to close this webinar and uh, looking forward to our next webinar with uh, another speaker. And I wish you all um, a nice evening or a nice day, depending on your time zone. Uh, goodbye from Islam and Liberty Network. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.